All right, so chapter nine. Now we're going to look at script node and how we encapsulate the uh, imperative code, uh, procedural code that can do things inside a declarative event graph. So here we go with script node. All right, now the way this works, as you might guess, since every animation behavior in X3D is oriented around the notion of events, passing a value around that changes something in the scene graph and makes it look differently, then any script code that we build and write will have to be connected up somehow to that event model if it's going to be effective in the rest of the scene graph. Uh, so let's see here. What, how does this work? We have uh, we have I think a missing uh, parenthesis here. No, I guess it's okay. Um, ah, yes. Let me get to the right page. There we go. We've got to match those parentheses. Try again. So what do we have? We have code that's sitting there, and you can think of it as a note. The script note is sitting in the scene graph, and we have an input event that comes in via route from somewhere in the scene graph, and then we have a method in the script that receives it, that event, and then some kind of computation occurs, and uh, as described in the next step, where uh, that calculation continues, and then when it's done, we respond with an output event. Okay, so there's uh, input, there's computation, and there's output. Let's rewrite this. Input, computation, and output. You may have seen this kind of diagram before. It has a very common name. I'll give you a hint. F, it's, you guessed it, a function. Okay, functional programming. This is a variation on that theme. We construct everything as if it were a function with a simple input and a simple output. And what are those inputs and outputs again? Ah, uh, yes, events. And the function itself is likely written in ECMAScript, but it could be written in Java. And someday, and in some browsers, it might be even written in other code. Now, to be historically accurate, let's uh, change the color on this little function box. And you probably guessed it again. I'm changing it to black because that's often what these things are called, black boxes, a black box function. And in fact, from the perspective of the rest of the scene graph, that's what it looks like, because the rest of the scene graph doesn't necessarily know or care what's inside that script. Rather, it just says, if I give it an input event, I'm gonna get an output event, or however that function is, is written. And so, <coughs> it's, as uh, authors, as X3D authors, our task now becomes, oh, what events do I want to expose, either as inputs or as outputs, and then how do I write that black box functionality that does the mapping from inputs to outputs to get the response I want, okay? So, uh, there you go, it's that simple. So if the rest of the scene graph animation makes sense, then scripts should make sense at the conceptual level now. Because a script node is just like any other node. It can accept inputs or it can produce outputs. Uh, which ones? Ah, that's where it gets interesting. That's up to you as the author to, to provide those. Okay. Now, since we are following uh, business as usual, event programming as usual, then, as you, you might expect, and you'll find, it's got to be typed. It's got to be strongly typed 
because if types are mismatched, the types must match because if they don't, uh, how do we get there from here? How do we put a Boolean into an integer? How do we put an integer into a three-tuple float for position? I, it, it makes no sense. So just as we restrict mismatch types anywhere else in the scene graph, anywhere else in the event model, we also restrict them here. So our uh, event model in this black box is strictly typed events come in, strictly typed events go out, and each arrow is indeed a route, just like before. So there you go. That's our, uh, that's our summary then of how the script node works. Let's look, a, look at a picture of this. And this picture is trying to show what a generic, uh, what a typical X3D player might do. Uh, here we're calling them browsers. Uh, lately, uh, we go back and forth on this one. You might call the X3D browser an X3D player or an X3D viewer, just because it seems to get uh, a little better uh, distinction between the HTML browser. So uh, what's going on? Well, in our scene graph, we're mostly concerned with the diagram on the left. That's our, our player. And we have a uh, scene graph connects uh, has most of our functionality. It has uh, all the geometry, all of the appearance, materials, colors, etc. It also has different sensor nodes. It can have a uh, time sensor clock, touch sensor, all the drag sensors. We can have a whole bunch of other nodes that are either uh, uh, interpolators producing values or uh, targets. You know, the geometry itself, what's getting modified. Okay, how are these guys hooked together? Well, as before, routes. Routes are where events get passed from input to output. Okay, so what this picture is trying to express then is that uh, from a browser's perspective, from the player's perspective, it's got to take care of all these things. It's got to have the ability to do nodes and sensors. It's got to be able to uh, do routes to connect them. <coughs> its execution engine would be the software that passes events along the routes. And so the addition here then is script node. How does that look compared to everything else? <coughs> so Jeff, we're going to please pause the tape at this point. Say connect everything else. Now I have advised you guys to never get old, right? If I, if I pass that on. The poop? Maker's will. Please explain um, while I recover my throat. Uh, he's the uh, so called futurist, but I think he was right about one thing, so not everybody thinks he's right about everything. And uh, advocating taking all kinds of nutritional supplements so that you live just long enough to get to the point where life will be extended to like 200 years old so that you'll live just long enough to, so when life be extended indefinitely via nanorobotics and then eventually turning them into a monster. He says that he's... What's, what's his name again? Would you mind... Uh, Ray Griswold? He's, he's a, a big, big name, too. Is he dead here? No. Okay. Oh, Kurt Swap. <laughs> Sorry, I, I misheard. Okay. Right, right. Yeah, he's... Uh, uh, the other, uh, the he's other guy... He's coming up on his 60th birthday, and his doctor says his blood chemistry is that of a 39-year-old. But he looks like he's about... A, but his face looks like he's about 70. So I'm not quite buying it. Yet. Mm -hmm. Doctors on the payroll. 
Yeah. 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 There's, there's, yeah. Heard things to say. Well, that doesn't even count the, the painting in the back bedroom. Did you say where he lives? Uh, I'm not sure where, where he lives. I, I think he goes all over the place in the lectures now. Yeah. He writes books. The uh, other guy to look at here who written a great book, lots of great books, Bruce Sterling. He's got is a science fiction writer. He's he wrote a book about uh, the gerontocracy, the people getting older and older and older and older. Uh, now it's um, driven by science and eventually tips to where you know the ratio of aging to years passing, instead of being uh, less than one number, goes goes by. Uh, very very interesting. Well, I'll get about another five minutes older here in this class, and we'll see if we survive. Okay. Okay, so, so what this picture is showing us then is not a picture of your scene graph or a scene, but rather we're trying to account for what pieces of functionality an X3D player has to take care of. So, in addition to those nodes, it has to be able to handle routes and handle events. So you could sort of conceptualize this as there's a parallel event graph going on within your scene graph. Okay, and we also we further conceptualize it to say that when we do script nodes encapsulating code uh, inside the scene graph, we could also put that outside there. So if we had an HTML browser that say had this guy embedded as an applet or a circlet or a plugin, you could talk back and forth to your encapsulating HTML page with JavaScript that's out there, just like HTML does. Okay, and so events <coughs> might go back and forth there and get fed from the HTML page or your external browser, whatever it is, and be interacting with the script node be interacting with the scene graph, okay? So conceptually, uh, there's a whole riot of relationships here, a variety of things that could plug together. Why is this diagram conceptual and not rigorous or required? Because one of the greatest strengths of X3D is it does not tell people how to write their code. It does not specify the exact implementation style they have to use. Rather, we define the functionality of what works where, why, and how, so that authors can create content that will be consistently implemented. If you're a software developer, if you're an X3D viewer author who writes software to do this, then you'll probably look at a diagram like this and say, well, yeah, we got this, and we got that, and we got the other, but we do it all differently. Let me draw you the diagram of our software. It might be UML, it might be something else. It could look quite different than this, okay? So this is a distinguishing factor in X3D and a few other specifications. When you go to the X3D spec and find this figure, you'll find that uh, it's not required. It's a suggested relationship from a software perspective. So that can be helpful to us as authors to see, oh yeah, 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 they got a lot of work to do. It's also maybe just as helpful to authors to say, that's your problem. I don't care. I just want to write seeds. I want to put script nodes in there. So we could toss that diagram away and not even worry about it. But we get back to how do we do things. So that execution model, which we know has to be there under the hood somewhere, even if we only get a few levers to change it, we have to say, well, let's understand what is going on for sure under the hood, and then of those few levers we get in a script node, in routes, in other producers, consumers, we can say, all right, let's coexist well with how a browser takes care of its business. So we here have a, a simplification, but a pretty good one of what are the steps occurring that the, as the uh, browser is drawing your picture? And you can think of that first off as we're drawing the screen. And what is the 3D picture we're looking at? Well, 
let's ask the, and answer the question, so it's like your X3D Bureau. First we'd say, where's my camera? What am I looking at? Let's find that position in space. Is it the exact position of the viewpoint? Has our user navigated the viewpoint a little bit? Okay, fine. We now know where our eyeball point is. Then we have to say, were there any events pending that we have to take care of? Was there a, a sensor input from the clock, the time sensor, or from the pointing device, or from the network, or what have you? Okay, those event values get put on a queue. They get put on a list. You can think of that queue as the to-do list. The to-do list of events. <coughs> what's up. And then we say, all right, now we've got these events backed up. What do we do with them? Well, we go through them one at a time and we route them. We send them from whatever I had ready to go. We send it to their destination and we update those scene graph fields, their targets. Okay. Now notice that sometimes the arrival of those things might have some secondary reactions. Like if we change a transform node to move something there might be some consider the browser might have to say, oh, okay, I moved all these things underneath it. I have to recheck some of those. Similarly, if we change, say, the geometry, we change an extrusion's parameters, it might say, oh, I better recompute everything. Recompute where all the triangles are. Okay, so we might amplify step three by saying, uh, and recompute as needed, as necessary, for stuff going on from those changes. And that leads us to step four, which says, hey, we might have gotten new events. If so, let's process them too. We just repeat steps two and three, and put them on the to-do list, route them, and we keep going until all of the events are done. Now we're up to step five, which is, We've got our scene graph. We compute it and we compute our picture and uh, look at uh, what's going on there and draw a picture. Okay, then the next step is uh, we swap it. Okay, what does that mean? Well, a double buffering mechanism is this would be on the screen and this would be what's drawn. So if our first screen was blank, then we, sw we swap them out and we say, okay, the one we just created, this will be our, uh, our view screen. And then the next time around, this will be the draw screen. Okay, so if we repeat this process, the next time our animation might have said, well, same face, but different color. When we're ready, we swap. And then this guy becomes the view screen, and that guy becomes the draw screen. At which point we might go to a completely different viewpoint and then say our next image will be get those happy faces, let's get a nice brick in there. I didn't know, whatever it is. But this is how we swap and draw. Now I did that double frame buffer swap. Each time we do that swap between the two double buffers, of course we have to update the clock. Because that clock tick is what indicates the passage of time. And we need the browser needs to know that delta T, how much time did it take for me to draw and swap it out because now I can say, all right, as I repeat this step and begin again, that delta T is often needed for how fast are things moving, how far along does my interpolator go, how far along does the clock input to my sequencer go, etc. Okay, so what we're seeing here is a process that occurs over and over and over. And each time the browser is looking at, with its camera, looking at the scene graph, figuring out what to draw, swapping it out, 
and repeating. And each time we'll go through that step. Congratulations to each of you who are authors. You don't have to do this. The browser does this. This is all the work that it does. We're simply setting up that good old scene graph so that it knows what to do. Given that we have this knowledge at our disposal now, we're ready to look at how do I set up my script? How do I go for it? Okay, so this will be a, a short session. Let's see where we're at. We've gotten now the logic. Let's go to our organizational slide. Here it is. We now have the logic of a script node, how it works, and we're ready to go into the uh, exact details and syntax of how do we define that black box? How do we list what are the input fields? What are the output fields? What are the persistent states that it can keep track of? And how do we compute the transfer function, the changes between input to output? Finally, lest we forget, if an event falls in the woods, nobody's there to hear it, we don't care. We finally wire up the routes to connect this script back into the scene. All right, see you there.